We've been hearing a lot about the term immune system lately, and sales for natural supplements are through the roof. So today I wanted to talk about what the immune system is and how it, what it does, and which supplements help to boost our immune system based on research. I'm Andrea Donsky, co-founder of Morphus, powered by Naturally Savvy. And today I have Joel Thuna, a fourth generation master herbalist and in his free time, he reads six to 10 clinical studies a day. Joel, welcome to our show. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so let's start with the six to 10 clinical studies a day. Is that true? And wow. <laughs> it is. Everyone has a hobby. Mine's being a bit of a science geek. <laughs> Love it. So you're basically, let, let's talk a little bit about what, what that means. So you're looking at papers, you're looking at actual studies. Give a little bit of a background. I actually look at everything. What happens is I get numerous feeds every day telling me what the new papers are out there, be they clinical studies, be them peer reviewed journals, be them uh, just general papers on a topic. And I investigate anything that interests me. So why is it so important for you to actually read the science? I'm a firm believer that history and folklore tells us the road to travel on, but science will actually tell us whether we took the right path or not. Now, there's been a lot of talk about certain supplements that, have, that we know in our industry that have helped or support the immune system or helped to boost it. And some of them have received a lot of, um, I guess, they're very popular these days and other, the others have received a little bit of negativity. So what I wanted to do today is really talk about certain supplements that we know can have a benefit on our immune system, what the science says, and then what, how much we should take, and then also what, why would we wanna be taking it, especially at this time? So let's start with vitamin C. Vitamin C, which you'll also see in some places referred to as ascorbic acid or L-ascorbic acid, is a water-soluble vitamin. And it's very important to know the difference between water-soluble and fat-soluble. Water-soluble vitamins, essentially what they are, are any vitamin that is carried in water. And the problem is that whatever you don't use of it is excreted through your urine every day. You don't, the body does not store any vitamin C. You take it, whatever you don't use, it's gone. Now, unfortunately, humans don't produce our own vitamin C. Other animals do, we don't. So we need to take enough every day to meet our body's needs. And, and in some, some people believe we should take a, a nice surplus. That way we're guaranteed there's no issues. Now, scientifically, vitamin C supplements were found to improve multiple immune system components, including the antimicrobials our body makes itself and white blood cell activities. Vitamin C contributes to maintaining the integrity of cells, very important, and also protecting them from the stress your body is under when it's fighting infections. And what I mean by that is you have to be very careful. When you're fighting an infection of any kind, be it, um, be it a hangnail, minor, just, just a cut, et cetera, whenever you're fighting an infection, your body's under stress. The bigger the infection or the more powerful the infection, the more the stress there is. And that, if, if your body's under serious stress, your systems are all under stress. So you wanna take stuff that can help your body encounter and control its stress. Regular use of vitamin C supplements has been shown to shorten the duration and intensity of viral infections, but does not reduce the risk of becoming ill. That's really important. So essentially, they can help you fight it when you have it, but they're not gonna stop you from getting it. Social distancing and all the other fun stuff will, but vitamin C itself will not stop that from occurring. Now, in stressed individuals, Vitamin C reduces the likelihood of illness in half. That's important. So by helping you handle the stress, it's helping you avoid getting ill in the first place. Unfortunately, another bad thing, your body just rips through vitamin C, reducing concentrations rapidly during any infection and also during stress. And let's be honest, all of us right now, are highly stressed. <laughs> These are highly stressful times. So we're just ripping through vitamin C. So that's the need that gives us the need to be able to take it many times a day. So you're not just taking it once a day, you want to take it several times a day. Definitely, without question. Now, it's available in tons of different forms. 
you can take it in capsules, liquid, tablets, powders, um, even gummies. I personally try to avoid gummies, chewables, and any sweetened product because the problem is almost all the sweeteners used are immune suppressants. And it doesn't make sense to me to take something to boost my immune system while at the same time taking something that's going to reduce my immune system capabilities. It just doesn't make sense to me. Just to explain what an immune suppressant is, it's something that actually puts your, like, it, it, it's a negative thing for your immune system. Correct. It suppresses the immune system, so it doesn't help to boost it. So that's what Joel, you know, like what Joel's referring to. So it could be sugar, it could be refined carbohydrates, it can be alcohol. Certain things actually depress our immune system, so suppress our immune system, so we want to stay away from them. Definitely, definitely, without question. Now, when it comes to vitamin C, most experts on a regular day when there's nothing serious going on recommend taking a thousand milligrams daily. Okay. Realistically, you could take two, three, four, five, even as high as 10,000 milligrams a day. It's not going to hurt you because you're just going to excrete urinate it. out whatever your body doesn't use. It is, however, acidic. It is an acid. And so just remember, if you're someone who has acid issues, you're going to want to take it with other stuff at the same time to reduce that acidic effect or take a buffered form. Mm. But please note, if you're not someone who has that an acid issue, there is no form of vitamin C, be it buffered, be it pure ascorbic acid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that is absorbed better than any other form. They all are absorbed the exact same. So if you see one out there that says it's ridiculously expensive because it's better absorbed, that's a load of hooey. Well, one, a load of hooey. Well, one of the well, two things that you said that I want to I want to touch on. You talked about taking it with something else if you have acidic issues. I just I do I don't want to forget because I know some of us might have questions of what does that mean taking it with what. But also, I've heard a lot about liposomal vitamin C, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's one of the ones you're referring to. So you're saying that it's it's not better because I've heard that it, oh, interesting. Okay. According to the research though, this is what I want to understand. So yep. according to the research, vitamin C is vitamin C is vitamin C is vitamin C. The differences in absorption are so minimal that they're, they, they have no statistical value. The differences. Okay. Um, what, what matters much more is that you are taking it consistently like not one day, yes, and then, oh, wait a week and take it again. No, no, you take it daily, every single day, multiple times a day, and that you consistently make sure that you're trying to reduce your stress. Because the whole point is, the more stressed you are, yeah. the, reduce you, the reduction you have in absorbing anything. It doesn't really matter what nutrient it is, right. including Good. vitamin C. Good point. Now I know that you. I see that you have papers in front of you. You're reading a little bit. So are these are the, are these these clinical trials that you're reading on? Because I want to. I want everyone, our viewers, to understand that what you're saying is based on these six to ten clinical trials that you're reading a day. So I just want to be clear that that's what you're reading from. It's from the science, from the research. Definitely, all of the stuff I'm using is all based on clinical clinical papers and reviews and expert opinion. It's all of those. Okay. Great. Let's talk vitamin D. Definitely. Vitamin D is one of my personal favorites. And the reason is everyone, I don't care who you are, everyone is deficient in vitamin D, even me, mm -hmm. everyone. It's almost impossible living in North America not to be. And the, the important thing is you have to understand vitamin D, how it works. Vitamin D is actually a family. It's not one specific vitamin. It's a family of vitamins, usually vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D can be produced by your body, which is a good thing. It's produced when your skin is exposed to direct natural sunlight for a period of time. Both forms of vitamin D need to be converted, though, by your liver to an active form of vitamin D your body can use. What I mean by that is your body cannot directly use vitamin D2 or vitamin D3. It has to be converted. Um, now, as I said earlier, unfortunately, Virtually every Canadian and American is deficient in vitamin D, and that's because we're not getting enough exposure to a high enough intensity sunlight. And that's actually a good thing because the, the exposure we would need on a prolonged basis has skin cancer issues. Right. So it, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act there, and that's why vitamin D supplementation is so important. 
Now, vitamin D isn't actually a vitamin. It's a hormone, isn't it? Correct. It is a hormone. It's called a vitamin because your body needs it. And the vitamin is a very loose definition, depending on who you talk to. Essentially, there are substances that your body requires on a daily basis to perform the daily activities your body needs to survive. Hmm. So yes, it is actually a hormone, but it's also a vitamin by that definition. And vitamin D, unlike vitamin C, is a fat-soluble vitamin. Correct. Vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin, which is why we excrete it through our urine after we take it. Do we need to take, because vitamin D is fat-soluble, do we need to be taking it with food that has fat in it? It's better to take with food that has fat in it, or what you can also do alternately is take it in a form where it's already in fat. Both of those are options. Uh, some of the more popular forms are oil-based ones, so you get that right off the get-go. So the ones I've seen is you know, the liquid. So is that what you're referring to? So when you take it in a liquid form, it's in some type of oil rather than an actual chewable or something that you could take it as a supplement form. So I, I think I need a little bit more, we all need a little bit more clarification on that. Not a problem. One of the more popular forms is in an oil-based drops. You have to be careful though, because some of the drops are water-based or alcohol-based. Those are not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the oil-based drops. Also soft gelatin capsules, inside soft gelatin capsules are oils, so you're getting it there as well. Essentially, if you're taking it in something that is a fat or an oil, you're getting the benefit of that because it is in nature a fat and it gets absorbed that way. Now there's vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Is there one that's better over the other? Because vegans, from what I understand, can't have the D3 format. Is that right? And why is Correct. that? Vitamin D3 comes from essentially two main sources. One of them is lanolin, which is the, the fat that uh, sheep excrete in their, through their wool, and that's not considered vegan. And the other form is from fish liver oils, be it cod liver oil, anyone who's old enough will know the taste of that, or any of the other oils um, from, from liver. So no vegan can touch that. So the vegans will stick to vitamin D2. Um, vitamin D3, as I said, are those two animal-based forms. The, the research is conflicting there. Most of the research on the safety of vitamin D and on high dose of vitamin D has actually been done on D2, the vegan form, whereby a lot of the recent studies on tolerability in small doses have actually been on vitamin D3. So the nice thing is there's a lot of research on both of them but the research on them is different. Both work. Both will increase your body's total levels of vitamin D. Vitamin D3 is slightly more efficient at it, but the efficiency level is so minimal that it's, it's six, one, half a dozen, the other. It, it's not a huge difference. So for example, in my family, we use vitamin D2. We use the vegan form. And the reason behind that is I personally just like it because I think it's a little cleaner. Hmm, interesting. You know, I've always understood that we need vitamin D3 for better absorption. So again, the research is saying that the absorption is pretty, you know, maybe a little bit more for D3, but it's pretty close should you choose vitamin D format. Yeah, it's, it's statistically just slightly different. It, it's a couple percent, not much more than that. Some people lead you to believe that it's 20, 30, 50, even I've seen someone say as high as 75. I've never seen a clinical paper that says it's more than a couple. Okay, so then basically it comes down to availability and choice. So whichever mm -hmm. one you decide to take. One thing about vitamin D that I'm fairly adamant about is we need to get our levels checked. Now, obviously now we're in self-isolation. <laughs> Many of us can't go to the doctor and get a blood test. But once you're able to, is to really understand what your, blood, what your vitamin D levels are. And like you said, Joel, most of us in North America are deficient in vitamin D. But understanding, and on, on our website, I will put links below, we have so many articles on vitamin D and what those optimal dosages are and what they, our levels need to be. But understanding where your starting point is, is really crucial too, because you want to get into that optimal range for your vitamin D. Definitely. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, what, one of the big things about vitamin D, though, you do have to remember, because it's fat soluble, if you go crazy, and when I say crazy, I, I know in some circles, they talk about taking 50,000, 100,000 IU a day. It, go, it will get stored in your body, and it'll actually begin to harm your liver. You can overdose on vitamin D, but 
let me say this, you have to try to do right. it. Exactly. <laughs> I think that's an important uh, distinction because taking 5,000, 10,000 IUs, even up to yeah. 20,000, or if you're you know, under the weather, won't create that toxicity if you're taking, so it's the 50,000 plus. And I've seen that research too, where, you know, if you're in it for a very short period of time, if you're, you know, you're not feeling good or whatever it is you're yeah. taking for to help, you know, support your immune system. So just, I want you to repeat that because I think that's an important point about vitamin D. Well, the important point is if you, if you go nuts, and I mean nuts, the 50,000, the 100,000, I've seen it as high as 200,000 people trying to do that on a regular basis, you're going to actually harm your liver. It is not good. If, however, you're feeling really ill and you're trying to do it or, you're, or you know what your level is and you're trying to boost it under the supervision of a medical professional, doing short-term high dose is fine. And that, that's not an issue, but long-term, it's a huge issue. But I'm not saying that 5,000 IU, 4,000, 2,000 IU is a high dose. That you could tolerate daily. I wouldn't go as high as 10,000 a day on a regular basis. But if you're going to do 10,000 a day, say, for example, when you're feeling ill for a week, that's fine. It's not going to hurt you. 10,000 a day for two years, your doctor's not going to be very happy with you. <laughs> no, and that's a very good point. Is there anything else you'd like to add about vitamin D from a research standpoint or anything we didn't discuss? Oh, definitely. Uh, deficiencies in vitamin D are associated with immune deficiency as well as increased susceptibility to infections of all kinds, not just respiratory, not just viral, all kinds. Recently, uh, Trinity College in Ireland released a very interesting paper discussing the link between vitamin D and COVID-19 specifically. The results of this come from a long-term study they're doing on healthy aging with over 8,000 participants. They concluded that vitamin D plays a critical role in preventing all respiratory infections. COVID-19 is a respiratory infection, and it reduces antibiotic use as well as boosting the immune system response to infections. Now, please understand, they did not look at vitamin D in people with COVID-19 because right now that would be unethical. They looked at vitamin D in the general aging population in Ireland and how it affects respiratory infections. And they then took that data and saw that it would also be applicable to COVID-19. So it's it very, I want people to understand that. They did not look at vitamin D and COVID-19. No one can look at that. It would be unethical. Right now, if someone has COVID-19, you're just trying to cure them. You're not trying to see if a specific thing will help a little, help a lot. No, no, you're trying to cure them. But they're using the general knowledge of what happens in respiratory infections and, and in with vitamin D and then translating that data to how it would work in COVID-19. Hmm, very interesting. And was there any research on vitamin C and COVID-19 that you came across? I found nothing that listed it from any authoritative source. And what I consider an authoritative source is a peer-reviewed journal. Um, that I'll go, I'll go into this for one second. When you're talking research, peer reviewed journals are one of the higher end. And what that means is someone goes, does a trial or writes a paper on a theory, and then it's reviewed by people who are experts in the field before it's published. You want to stick to only those when you're saying research, because otherwise anyone, including me can write a paper, publish it, and then all of a sudden, if you give that the same weight, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know as much, despite all my reading, despite the years I've been doing this, I don't know as much. I am not an expert on vitamin C and infectious disease. I leave that to the actual experts and I'll read what they say and interpret it, but they're the experts. They're the people writing the papers. I'm the person reading them. <laughs> and you read a lot of them. Yes. <laughs> In your spare time, because, you know, there's nothing else to do. I love it. Okay. How much to take and how to take? Um, as I said, it's available in tablets, capsules, and liquid. My preference, as we've already discussed, is to use oil-based drops. Now, vitamin D is also one of those vitamins you want to make sure you don't just take as an adult. You also get your kids on. For example, I have an 11-year-old. He takes it every day, and he's been taking it every day since we've had him. <laughs> He's on it. It's one of those key ones he never misses. Ch according to the government, 
children should be aimed to take 400 IU a day and adults should aim to take 1,000 IU a day. I personally and many experts out there consider these to be the minimum recommended levels. For example, my 11-year-old takes between 1,000 and 2,000 IU a day. I personally take between three and 5,000 IU a day. But I do think it also comes down to knowing your level. So if you, everybody's yes. body is different, right? And genetically too. So if your body doesn't, I guess, process it the way some other people do, some people might need it every day. Some people might not need it every day. Again, it, for me, in my opinion, you're the guy, you're the guys reading the clinical trials. <laughs> but for me, from what I understand is that we really need to understand what our blood levels are and constantly monitor that. So, and, and, we have to pay for vitamin D tests. Many of us do have to pay for it, but in my opinion, it's a really good investment to pay for it because you'll actually know what those levels are and then you can monitor it and take your dosing accordingly. Agreed. Knowledge is always power. I'm one of those people, I agree with you. When I go in for my physical every year, it's one of the boxes I tell my doctor to tick on the blood sample. There's a lot of boxes I get him to tick. But uh, yeah, and the whole point about it is you can't supplement wisely until you know your starting point. I want to talk about one supplement that has been getting a lot of not a lot, but let's say has been getting some negative attention. And my mom, I was, and it's a supplement I take all the time. It's called oregano oil. And I love oregano oil and I've been taking it for years. And my mom called me a couple of weeks ago when all of this self-isolation hit and we we're in quarantine. And she was, and she had told me that I should turn on the news because the news is saying that, you know, oregano oil may not be good for you and can cause more harm than good. I want to get to the science. Number one, is there science behind oregano? And I want to know, does it help to support and boost our immune system? Oregano is one of those things. Uh, I will be honest. It's one of my pets. I love it. I go through it like you would not believe. I, I am nutty enough. I even cook with it. It's, it's one of my favorite things out there. I've been doing this probably 30, 35 years I've been using oil of oregano. I love it. I probably have a good half dozen bottles in my house of the various forms to make sure no matter which way I want it, I got it. Now, you have to understand, oil of oregano is made from oregano essential oil. And I don't care what essential oil you're talking about, they're potent. As soon as you move to something that's a spice-based oil, it's even more potent. Now, the reason I'm going into that, I'm saying is, you want to treat it with respect. And they may say, no, how do you respect an oil? It's an inanimate object. The way you respect it is you respect its potency and its power. You can overdose on it and you can go way too far. The adage that if a little is good, a lot is better does not apply here. And that's where I think a lot of the concern around oregano oil is happening. That's one reason. Another reason is there's a sector in our industry that unfortunately likes to overhype stuff. And as soon as you start overhyping, what you do is you start making claims that are non-justifiable and that's when people catch you. And it, it, it's wrong, it, it is. Instead, we'd like to sit and say, okay, this is what we know, not what we think, this is what we know, and that's what you base your decisions on. And oregano is one of those things. We know X about it, we know it can do this. Under these circumstances, we think it might do some other stuff, but we're not going to talk about that today because it's not what we know. Now, many spice essential oils, not just oil of oregano, are potent anti-heat pathogens. In particular, oregano is widely recognized because it is a potent antimicrobial, antiviral, and antifungal. Now, here's the kicker. All the testing on that has been done either in a Petri dish, in lab settings, or in animals other than humans. But this led oregano to being studied also for its immune boosting activity. And in that case, we have actually done studies on multiple animal species, including humans. We don't know the exact mechanism of how it does it, but it does boost the immune system. We believe it's the relationship between two of oregano's key components. And every essential oil has a class of components called terpenes. Some people pronounce them terpenes. Terpenes are the volatile compounds where as soon as you open the bottle, you get this woof of smell. All those are the terpenes leaving the oil. So 
two of the specific ones that oregano has that have been studies are carvacrol and thymol. And what makes oregano fairly unique, because carvacrol and thymol are also found in numerous other spice oils, for example, rosemary, sage, um, thyme, uh, what sets oregano difference is the ratio between carvacrol and thymol. It's high in carvacrol and low in thymol. They both, they both do exert activity in the body, but at the various levels, and it's the, they believe the interplay between them that gives oregano its strength. Now, one thing you do have to note, all spice oils are strong. I don't care which oil it is, they're strong. If you have a tendency to have issues with spice oils or even with spices themselves, you're going to want to take one of the forms that isn't a direct oil. Like a capsule. Like a capsule or there's also buffered oils out there where they've added other oils such as orange and lemon to reduce the taste. But you also have to be careful of capsules. If it's an oil capsules, for example, a soft gel, a lot of people who have sp issues with spices also have issues with them. There are, oil, there are capsules out there where they've spray dried the oil onto something like calcium or onto fiber. Those ten people tend to be able to tolerate much better. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, what, uh, so I just want to repeat again. So there yep. is research. 100% on the benefits of oregano oil on helping our immune system. Correct. On boosting it, yes. Okay. They, they're not certain exactly how it does it, but they know it does it. So it helps to support our immune system and boost it. How Correct. much oregano oil, what, what does the research say on the dosaging? The research is wide on that. From very low dose to ridiculously high dose to the point where I would say you'd have a hard time, even someone like me who's been doing it for decades would have a hard time handling it. My personal bent on it is I use a super strength oil liquid and I take two drops a day regularly. If I'm at a time where it's everyone around me is sick or I'm concerned about it or I'm feeling under the weather, I'll double it to two drops twice a day. That to me is fairly potent and I, I'm not joking. I take it and I start feeling it right here after literally three seconds. You can feel it warming. You make a good distinction because there's some that are extra strength or super strength, some that are regular strength. I normally take regular strength and I'll do 10 drops under my tongue and then I'll drink it down with some water if I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. One thing I do want to ask you, and I've heard again, differing opinions on this, but I want to know what the research says. I've heard that you're saying you take it every single day, two drops every single day. Now that's a very small dosage, but I've heard that if you take it for long periods of time, it actually can disrupt your like the good bacteria in our gut. Is that true? There are theories on that. I have not seen a single clinical paper that addresses that either positively or negatively. What I can say in my own personal experience is I hedge my bets. And what I do is I take oregano daily and I wait at least a half an hour and then I take a probiotic daily. Mm. I, mm. I do both. I'm, 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 a, I'm a person who hedges my bets. I'll be honest. If there's no research out there telling me one way or the other, I go, Hey, it's not going to hurt me. Why not do both? <laughs> no, that's good information. Cause I was curious because I've heard it, you know, I've heard that it does. I've heard that it doesn't, but you're telling me according to, to what you have personally read, you don't know, I guess, every single thing out there, but what have you read? You've never come across anything that have said, that has said. Correct. That. And I've looked because uh, people have said to me that before and have asked me that question. Uh, we've looked, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate in my family. I have a medical research librarian who, this is what she does and she hasn't been able to find it either. Interesting. And that's, and that person is? My wife. <laughs> so she's pretty close. That's why I want to make sure that. Very close. <laughs> so the two of you, wow, you guys on your spare time must have, you like, you guys are fun. <laughs> uh, depends on your definition of fun, but we, 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 we tend to think we have a good time. <laughs> I love it. No, I think that's great. No, again, it's coming back to the science and the research and you do that research. So I, I want to be very clear and I, I love that. Let's move on to another supplement that I love as well. And this is elderberry. Again, elderberry. I love it. 
I love it too. Now, elderberry, there's been a little bit of information, again, kind of similar to oregano oil in the news where they're talking about cytokine storms and there's information, misinformation. I want to get to the science. Let's talk about what elderberry is, why it's great for what it benefits, how it benefits our immune system, and what does the research say? Not a problem. Elderberry is, is fun. Uh, black elderberry specifically, because almost all the research is on black elderberry. Any supplement you're going to find out there is going to be made from black elderberry. It's not going to be one of the other kinds. It, it's actually a bush that's been used in herbal medicine for centuries. There, there's reported use of it and documented use of it going back over a thousand years. It was initially found in Europe. It's now grown throughout the Northern Hemisphere, including Canada and the United States. Um, in people with respiratory infections, supplementation with elderberry was found to substantially reduce upper respiratory symptoms and enable them to recover faster. It does not prevent, please understand, it will not prevent, it helps you recover faster and reduce symptoms. They also did studies on frequent air travelers, which are at much higher susceptibility to respiratory infections. And they found that elderberry offered significant reduction in duration and severity of their respiratory infections, which is really important. Now, elderberry has been used and is used by millions of people around the world daily to prevent this, usually during cold and flu season, but those are respiratory infections. So it just pushed out into other things. And it got a lot of press with COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a respiratory infection. I do want to make it clear here. There is absolutely no research on it in COVID-19 because as I said earlier, that would be unethical. No one's going to do that. So anyone who says to you, well, I heard the research da, 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 on COVID-19. No, there is no research at all on elderberry and COVID-19. There is a lot of research on elderberry and respiratory infections of which COVID-19 is a respiratory infection, but there are no direct studies on COVID-19. I just wanna make that really clear. And that is very clear. Now, what, how does elderberry benefit the immune system? What it does is they found that it helps the white blood cells just do their job. <laughs> For lack of a better phrase, it just helps them do their job. It helps them attack and destroy pathogens. And how do we take elderberry? Because I know that there, and I know you're not a fan of gummies, but I actually do. There's a <laughs> brand of elderberry called Zambucol that I do love, and I do love to take their, I give it to my kids, their gummies. And they also have liquid, and I take it in, in different forms as well. But how should we take it, and, and what is the dosage on elderberry? Well, I'll be honest, the elderberry gummies, I've tried the exact ones you're talking about, and I will say they're yummy. <laughs> I view them as a candy, personally. They're yummy. Yeah. Um, elderberry is available in syrups, gummies, capsules, liquid concentrates. Personally, my bent on it is I prefer the organic capsules, and the reason is I, I try to go personally for the cleanest, purest form of a product, and I always try and get it without any sweetener of any kind. And if you're going to do a gummy or a syrup, inherently there are sweeteners in them. Now, some of them, I'll admit, are low sweetener, but that's just my personal bent. I, I prefer to go as pure as I can. That's why I go organic capsules. It's just two ingredients and there you go. Um, when it comes, if you're going to take the syrup, the dosage, clinical dosage, are 15 to 30 ml of a syrup daily. If you're going to go with gummies, I think I've seen anywhere from 4 to 12 a day for adults, depending on the strength of the gummy, because there are different strengths out there. With the capsules, uh, I take regular times of the year. I will take two capsules a day, so one capsule twice a day. In times like now, I've upped it to two caps twice a day. Can we talk about this cytokine storm? Because I think there's a lot of maybe, you know, there's a lot of misinterpretation out there and misinformation. So explain exactly what a cytokine storm is and in particular how it pertains to elderberry and why it's even become an issue or a discussion, I guess a topic of discussion. To my understanding, a cytokine storm is when your body is attacking your white blood cells specifically are attacking an invader they produce these substances called cytokines and they help it do what it does and a storm is when there's a ton of them now elderberry has been found in 
I believe it was one marginal study to impact that slightly. To my understanding, they have not gone through multiple rigorous tests to see if it's a long-term effect or if it's even a repeatable effect. But there was one study that said it inhibited those slightly. Again, this is not my area of expertise. I haven't done a ton of research on it and don't even think there is a ton of research on it right now. And I so, know we're going to put a link below. We do have an article on our website about it that does state, um, quote, several references. So I'll put that below as well. Is there anything else about elderberry that you want to touch on, that you want to talk about that we didn't talk about today? Well, one of the fun things is elderberry being a berry, it's one of those things you can actually incorporate into your life in different ways. Um, I'm actually quite a big fan of elderberry jam. <laughs> Just so yummy. Elderberries and pectin. It's nummy. <laughs> I visit an elderberry farm where we would literally take the elderberries off the bushes and eat them. And they're so oh, yeah. good. <laughs> really oh, yeah. They, I, I'm one of those people. I love cranberries and elderberries to me are just more flavorful cranberries. <laughs> I agree. Yes. Yeah. Very yummy. All right. Good. Yay. Next ingredient. There's been a lot of talk about mushrooms. Now we know mushrooms help support the immune system, but in particular chaga. And I remember learning about chaga many, many years ago, but I know this is something you wanted to talk about because there is research showing that how chaga can help support our immune system. So please tell us a little bit about what chaga is and how it can help us. Definitely. Mush mushrooms are wonderful things. And I don't just mean for medicine, also just as culinary, they're wonderful. They're very versatile and they're very nutritious. Chaga is a mushroom-like fungus. That that's a big thing. It's not actually a mushroom. It's called a mushroom because it's very similar to them, but it's not a mushroom. And it grows wild on the side of some trees in North America and in Northern Europe, particularly birch, but you can also find it on some maple trees, you can find it on oak trees, but it's mainly birch. What it does is it actually is, uh, it sucks some specific phytocompounds out of the trees and concentrates them. So if you have, for example, a birch tree, it'll take some of the phytonutrients from the birch tree and concentrate them inside its body. And that's why it's, they're so nutritious is because they take things that are in very small amounts in the tree and concentrate them greatly to where they're at therapeutic doses. Now, to understand how chugga helps, we need to first understand inflammation. We, we touched on it briefly earlier. Inflammation is a natural response of your immune system that helps protect us against diseases and inflammation and sorry and infections however long-term inflammation is bad it actually suppresses our immune system and at the same time is linked to numerous other diseases like heart disease basically bad things studies show that chaga can positively impact immunity by reducing long-term inflammation at the same time, it also helps to fight pathogens directly. Chaga helps your body produce cytokines. And just for a definition here, cytokines themselves are special proteins that regulate to the immune system. And by helping your body produce these cytokines, it stimulates your white blood cells and encourages them to help fight pathogens and go on. Basically, it's a cheering section for your white blood cells. The nicest thing about chaga is A, it's, there's no negative to it. Ma many, many things out there that help your immune system. You see earlier, we talked about vitamin D, for example, you can go overboard or oil of oregano. You can go overboard with chaga. You can't really, you can take as much as you, like. you can use it as just something you enjoy taking. If you like, some people take the tea daily as, as just a tea. They enjoy the taste. That's, that's a good thing that you don't have to worry about taking too much. It's very helpful and it gives you peace of mind. Um, chaga, as I said, is available in tea. It's also available in liquids of various concentrations and capsules. Once again, I prefer taking capsules. I take the organic capsules because I find they're clean, they're pure, they're convenient, and they're just easy to take. They and just how much we, like I know you said we can't overdose on it, but how much should we be taking of chaga a day? Is there like a uh, dosage? Is there actually something that's recommended? I guess or follow the the, the uh, instructions on the label. 
You can follow the instructions on the label. If you look, for example, Health Canada, I think says, and I'm pulling from memory here, that you can't go over 10 grams a day. And that, that's a ton. <laughs> that, that's a massive amount because 10 grams, just so you know, is about 25 capsules. <laughs> I don't see people doing that. And I also don't see people going out there and downing a, a 50 ml bottle. I, I just don't see that happening. Um, my personal bent on it, I would take two capsules a day. Um, I have done the tea before. I've enjoyed brewing the tea. And what you can do with the tea is you brew it, enjoy it. Don't throw away the part that is the tea, the leftover. Rebrew it again and again and again. And you can keep doing it until it becomes just too light in color. Then you take it, dry it, grind it up, and you can put it in food. Oh, okay. That's you actually thing. throw nothing away. You use the whole thing. I love that. And they're really cool looking too, Chaga, when you've seen it on a birch tree, like it's like this beautiful, and it's, it's a cool looking uh, mushroom. So definitely. But one thing, please do not harvest them wild. They in, in the wild, you need to let them grow because they'll grow to a specific size and then they'll actually release spores so that they can repopulate themselves. If you harvest them without knowing what you're doing, we, we, we could actually eradicate them by accident, mm, that's turn really them to be extinct. They're hard to find though. Like in the, you have to, you know, I, I know that a friend of mine did a documentary on it and they went looking for chaga. So it's not something, I guess it, it, it appears more in certain areas than others. So, but that's a really good tip. If you find one, don't harvest it and leave that to, I guess, the experts. Yeah, definitely. What you can do to truly enjoy it, take a really nice picture of it for your memories, but don't geotag the picture. Because if you do, someone else will go and they'll, 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 they'll rip it off the tree. <laughs> there you go. Good, good tip. And I also think it's important before we end our interview today that we mention, of course, supplements can help, but healthy diet, making sure we're making the right food choices, avoiding things that suppress our immune system, like we talked about earlier, like refined carbohydrates, like all the white stuff, refined sugar, alcohol, things that we know have a negative impact on our immune system. So things like that, we want to stay away from or really limit, especially if you're trying to keep your immune, your immune system boosted and supported at this time, exercise, reducing our stress. So all of that together helps to make for that healthier immune system. Would you agree? Definitely. And one other big one is try to avoid trans fats. Mm, big, yes. Big thing to avoid. Part of the scary seven, all experts agree, there is no safe limit of trans fats. And the way you could find them on a label, even if it says zero on the actual label itself, look to see if it has any hydrogenated fats because uh, that's, uh, that's a big one. Joel, thank you so much for your time today. This has been so informative and so needed because I really wanted to delve into the science when it comes to natural supplements. As you know, I've been in the natural supplement and healthy living industry, natural organic industry for 20 years. I'm a big proponent of natural supplements, but I really wanted to dig deep into the research. So thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. I smiled a lot. And as I can say, anytime it will be, and it has been my pleasure. If you got value out of today's video, please share it and please give us a big thumbs up and leave a comment. I want to hear from you. What are you doing to support your immune system? We really appreciate you watching, sharing, and turning on that notification bell because we will come to you every single week with two new interviews. Stay well and stay happy and healthy. Bye.